Good evening. If we may have your attention, we'll begin our program for the evening. We have a short business meeting, and we have a uh, wonderful program for this evening, so we'll save most of the part for our presentation. Uh, call the meeting to order, and <clears throat> this I, I would remind you that this is the last program for this year. And before I forget, I would like to thank everyone that attended the programs throughout the year. I hope you enjoyed them. We would certainly appreciate any input you have, any suggestions that you might have for the future in bringing programs uh, to our uh, meetings here. Uh, Mary has done a great, great job. She uh, continues on and uh, she, I understand that she has two programs lined up for next year already. So we look forward uh, to those. At this time, I would ask Cindy to give us the secretary's report. Cindy. Okay, we met on September 13th and Bill Swisher called the meeting to order. The secretary's report was read and approved. Um, Sally made a motion to accept the report. Susie Monroe seconded the motion. There was no treasurer's report, but there was also no financial activity. Um, under old business, Mary reported, or Bill, I can't remember, <laughs> that there was, <laughs> it doesn't probably matter, but that there was um, good participation for the cemetery tour up at the McGraw Cemetery on August 26th. Under new business, um, Bill promoted the Cortland County Historical Society's fundraiser at Tonelli's. They had a baseball theme that was on September 19th. And the October 11th program would be about the Salisbury Fire Equipment Company. And Mary asked for assistance with refreshments. Um, then Mary introduced Antonia Colella from Auburn. She spoke to the group about her research on Theodore Case and his development of talking movies. Refreshments were served to 15. A motion and a second. Okay. We need a motion, please. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the Treasury report, I would just mention to you all that we did attend the uh, baseball historic meeting uh, program at the Hathaway Hall. And a number of us did attend that. And uh, talking about history and talking about the old timers in baseball, it was a terrific meeting and it brought up a lot of memories of what transpired in the way of history in, in sports in uh, Cortland County. So it was very interesting and uh, we certainly appreciated the opportunity to attend that. Uh, I call on Mary now for the Treasurer's Report. <clears throat> Donna, is, Donna Fox is the acting uh, Treasurer and she was called away this evening, so this is uh, just a general um, year-end report. Um, we have a savings account uh, that's taken care of by the village, um, 6,756.73. A lot of that's from an inheritance that, that we received, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, Lottie Champlain, and we haven't used it a lot. Uh, once in a while we've bought um, something for the history room in the way of equipment and uh, so it's nice to have and we're we're fortunate to have some money and not be uh, looking for raising money all the time. Uh, Donna reports that we have a checkbook balance of 5,557.22 and, and you know that's that's wonderful to have. Uh, we bought um, another um, four drawer filing cabinet which we desperately needed and we had the money to buy it with so it's a big help. Um, util we, we paid the utilities for the year. Uh, the library, uh, when, when the history room, uh, history room opened, uh, we made an agreement they were going to charge us a percentage of the bill so that's how it works out. 
and it's quarterly, and um, it works out just fine. So that's that's the treasurer's report, and we probably need a motion to uh, approve that also to accept it. May we have a motion to accept the treasurer's report? We have a motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, any old business that we should take up? If none, I'll go on to new business. Any new business? I just have a comment I would like to make. Uh, as we look in the audience here, we're all growing older. <laughs> young at heart. Growing older, but young at heart. And uh, we want to see this organization keep going and be very strong. We need somehow to be thinking about some ideas. How do we generate more interest and more attendance in our meeting? We certainly had some great meetings, a lot of history that's been given to us and provided for us. And if we can only continue to pass this kind of history on to our younger people. And uh, I think we're going to have a meeting tomorrow and one of the topics will be to uh, how do we generate uh, more interest uh, with the younger crowd and uh, what can we do about it. So I bring this to you because if you have some ideas, it would be greatly appreciated to share with us, share with Mary, share with myself or any board member. And uh, we would like that. Yes? Uh, as far as I know that uh, New York State history is required of students when they're still in high school or let's hope in elementary school so they learn something and carry that. Uh, is there been a discussion with anybody at the local school concerning maybe mandated projects that the students have at school uh, that they would come to a meeting up until about uh, up until about five years ago maybe uh, in June on a hot week the teacher would call from the elementary school and say we're supposed to have a half an hour of New York State history can we come over to the history room <laughs> well what can you tell in half an hour <laughs> it's unbelievable uh, and they don't do it anymore so I don't know if it's no longer required. I don't know what the stipulation is. Going back to when I was in junior and senior high in Norwich, we had a New Yorkers Club. And in my freshman year, or my seventh grade year, I had a whole year of New York State history. Uh, the teacher was really disgusted that I couldn't put Long Island on the map when I drew it. I had it out by Nantucket, I guess. I don't know where I had it, but anyways, that was part of the studies. And um, Tabitha at the County Historical Society and I have been trying to figure out if we could start a New York, a Yorkers Club again. Um, I remember uh, in Norwich, we went to Cooperstown, we went to Syracuse, we went to see the Erie Canal. Um, we did a lot of traveling, and it was wonderful, and it was hands-on history. That was what was fun about it. We weren't sitting and listening to somebody to drone on about whatever. Um, I'd like to see some young people, uh, 40s and 50s, uh, who would we could get them interested. Um, I think that's what we're going to work on. Our officers, I think we're going to see if we can't come up with a program next year that might appeal to uh, there's there's some young young families in the village now and it would be nice to have them involved uh, learning a little bit more about where they live so um, keep thinking and if you come up I I'm open to any ideas I mean we could have a rock band well, I guess. Rock has some interesting places and interesting people so I would think that would be a place to start the school yeah yeah. I don't know whether they know what took place over in the box factory or the railroad station. Yeah. When yeah. we think about it, they're playing soccer. They're not really. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. They, they are required to have.
so many hours of community, Are they still? community service in order to graduate. Oh. So possibly attending a, a meeting. Yeah, how could count as That's something we could think about next year. <laughs> yeah, and contact. Oh, yeah, that list of opportunities. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a really good idea. Well, any other ideas? We'd be glad to have them. Thank you, Mary. One of the things that I had thought of is that uh, bring a friend to the meeting. So maybe it's something you can think about for another year. You, if you are one of these, uh, one of them that would attend most of our meetings, or I, perhaps you can speak to your neighbor, and uh, that way you could uh, encourage more people, and perhaps uh, and that sense they could encourage some others and maybe we could grow with some younger people in in that respect but again I want to <clears throat> before we go to the program I want to thank the officers and especially Mary uh, I want to thank the uh, all of you for attending throughout the year and I want to thank those that have provided refreshments for us uh, throughout the year we certainly enjoyed those at, at the end of each meeting. So again, thanks and we appreciate all your kindness and uh, your help and support. Uh, and going back to what uh, we were just talking about, uh, I know in fourth grade, pretty much that was spent on uh, New York State history. And I think seventh grade, I don't, I've lost track anymore. So I really don't know exactly, but I think in order for graduation, they do have to have some service uh, uh, in the community of some sort for graduation. But here again, that's getting, I don't know whether it takes place when you're a junior or a senior or whatever, but uh, uh, a lot of schools have uh, junior historic clubs. And uh, through that, they do some of the kind of, uh, some of the things that, that we do here and, uh, and maybe that would interest uh, the young people a little bit more to uh, uh, getting involved in this kind of thing as they grow up. It used to be that they did, in some grade, maybe it was uh, uh, genealogy, of their family genealogy, mm -hmm. and that uh, was, helped promote their interest for that year. Yes. And then maybe they put it away. There must be a Boy Scout troop over here. Yes. 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 See what their projects are locally. It's another. That's another idea to get them, uh, get them involved. And I don't know how many of you. I, I assume and hope that many of you have visited the uh, historic society building over here, uh, where we have many, many things uh, in that little building. There are lots of lots of things that uh, are in history to. Uh, McGraw and the surrounding area. So it's, it's, it's really uh, a good organization for a small community like this. In conclusion, <clears throat> I have a picture I'd like to pass around. And uh, it's interesting because it's a picture of the McGraw corset factory. And uh, I don't know which building it was, but anyway, my wife got it for me off the internet. And I want you to notice in there that all the workers are male. So the now, just a minute. They're all male. And they're dressed, you know, they have suspenders on, they have a necktie on, they're operating machines. And I said, where are the women? So I look over here further in the picture, so on the right hand side, there's one lady. She is the boss. <laughs> so, things haven't changed, ladies. You're in power, believe me. So I will pass this around. And at this time, I can call on Mary to conduct the rest of the meeting. Thank you. How about what you said? Can you tell by the clothes for Oh, golly. Really, really early 1900s. Really, really early. We say 1900. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a, a the men did the packing, the, the, the corsets, 
The garments came down into another another area of the factory, and the men did the packing. So, I mean, that was not the other. Somebody, my, my thought was that the women were riveting or something. And Somebody has to be in charge. <laughs> Women's lib. <laughs> um, the one thing we need to take care of is election of officers for uh, next year. And normally our programs go until November, so we would take care of it in November. Well, that's not the case now. So we need to take care of it now. And uh, President uh, Williams Fisher, we don't have a vice president, we have a vacancy. Anybody that would like to volunteer, it's not very much work. Um, mm -hmm. Cindy Craig's agreed to be secretary again, and Donna Fox will be acting um, treasurer. Our, our regular treasurer has been ill quite a bit during the year, so um, I haven't, uh, she hasn't decided she doesn't want to do it anymore, and I'm not hurrying her, because Donna is wonderful in volunteering to take care of it. I need a motion, or I need, if there's any other nominations, or if anyone would be willing to fill the vice president uh, space, we'd like it. If not, I would ask for a motion to accept this slate of officers. Would somebody so move? I'll make the motion. Somebody second it? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill said I had a couple programs planned for next year, and I do. And um, Chuck DiIrio, I'm, I'm no, that's not correct. He's going to speak in September next year. Um, he's he's uh, done some programs at the depot in Cortland, and he's going to talk about upstate. And I think he said in a hundred words or less. So I have no idea how he's going to do it in a hundred words or less, but. We may barely sit down and he's going to be done, so I don't know. And he's very good. I've heard him twice there. And he's really good. He really is good. And he comes from Shenango County. That's even better. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get a plug in. Um, Chip Jeremy's going to do me a do a. Um, he's got a very good uh, PowerPoint program on Cortland trolley cars. It's really good. So. I think it'd be fun if we could get a trolley car and go up to Little York for a picnic, maybe. <laughs> that would be great fun. I'm trying to get somebody to do Grace Brown and, <laughs> and uh, uh, Chester. Uh, I'm trying to find an author who has done a book and has written a book. And uh, he lives in New England. I'm trying to catch up with him and see if he would come and do something on, on Grace and Chester. Do you know about Grace and Chester? I think most people do. You know, but we stay interested in it, don't we? <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't change. <laughs> you know, the ending doesn't change. But uh, anyways, I thought that might be of interest. And if you come up with a program that you'd like to have, let me know. I'd be glad to do it. Um, I am so pleased that uh, Alan Salisbury, Salisbury would come and do a program for us. Uh, I had heard him speak at Glenhaven, and, and he was really, it was so interesting. What was interesting to me tonight was, my father-in-law was mayor in the 1950s, and Alan said he remembered coming uh, with his father to sell McGraw a fire truck. And he said, I know I met with a Mr. Kimberly, and I said, well, it would have had to be my father-in-law. And I said he was probably a tough cookie trying to get the price down. <laughs> Anyways, Alan, we're so glad that you could come. He's heading for Osaka, Japan tomorrow. Can you imagine? I don't know how he's going. Well, he's got a driver, so maybe he can sleep on the way down. <laughs> I got here tonight, and I have two graduates from Tully School at Cape, Ann and Bob Ransom here, and uh, that was pretty cool. I haven't seen Bob in a couple, three years. But uh, we had 40, what, three in our graduating class in Tully? I think it was, in 1961. The biggest class until then. Was it? <laughs> she got married in December. I got married in August of our graduating year. Whoa. And we're both still married. To the same women. Same husbands, too. The same husbands. <laughs> my, 
pretty unusual. So we were the first, I was the first married in my class, and you were second. So that's pretty cool. Bob and I grew up together. He was from Apulia Station. We went trapping, played basketball together, had a lot of fun. And we were both in Yorker clubs. And both in Yorker Club. Yeah. We just said we went to Cooperstown together. And uh, that was good. That was a lot Albany. of fun for us. Yeah. Albany. Albany, yep. Yeah. We went to Albany House State Lines. Capitol. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. House Caverns. So, House Caverns, holy man. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think the, uh, what do they call it, the elderly people at Grace Church in, in Homer asked me to speak a couple years ago. So I did that, and that was a lot of fun. And then uh, I did, we did it at Glen Haven. My wife Nance, uh, is her family name was Dever, and her dad was a farmer up on Scott Road. And then my dad and was from Tully, and his dad ran the Ford Garage, which was Berthamidus, which went back to Salisbury's in the early 1900s when they had a blacksmith shop. Uh, both our families, crazy has been in this valley for 150 years wow. so we've had a lot of generations come up through you know on both sides of our families and Nancy's every time she gets that penny saver or whatever it is she has to read the the history of Homer that I think Mike Sweeney does but uh, I think this is you know she's telling me all these things and I go okay I'll see you <laughs> so uh, but just to run over a little bit about the company make sure I on time here and get through this with it with you and not bore you to death but uh, my dad was real name was uh, Fancher not and they called him Sam uh, dad liked his beer and it seemed like every time he had to go from Kurtz welding which was in the back road from Marathon the Tully he had to go by that hotel right there <laughs> okay and that was his pit stop, kind of, on the way home on the back road coming from Kurtz Welding, where we were building our tankers. And in there was a young man that was in the fire department that went to Oklahoma State. And my dad talked to him and talked me into it, and so that's how I got to Oklahoma State to be a fire protection engineer. So that bar means something to me. <laughs> you would never think it would change your life because I ended up my whole life in fire. Uh, let me turn this thing off. Yeah. I'll turn that off so it doesn't ring on me. Uh, my, I guess I don't know how many generations, but in 1892, our family had a blacksmith shop in Tully and they built the first fire trucks for Tully. And that's back there on the table, you see a, a, like a pool hose wagon, we would call it today. And most of the local blacksmith shops built those first fire trucks. And then they had hydrants and that was hooked to the hydrants and that's how they put the fire out. They didn't even have fire trucks. Now Cortland would have a steamer and that would come here to a big fire, or go to Homer, you know, like a school fire and stuff like that. Nancy told me the other day that Homer's school burned down three times. Wow. And uh, I'm going, it was a lot of bad luck for that place. But uh, we've had five generations. My son Eric uh, works for a fire truck company. And my grandson Daniel, he's 16 and he hopes to be a firefighter. So we're hoping that'll be our sixth generation in fire service. Uh, the, in the 1930s, the, you know, the crash of the business climate, you know, put my grandfather out of business at Tully Garage, and that's when Berthamnu took it over, and that was the transition from Salisbury's from the Model T's and Model A's over, over to that. Uh, Dad worked at Brewer Titchener uh, during the war, and during the day, he was a fireman at the Cortland Fire Department. So he had two jobs, and my mom lived over in Freeville with my grandmother, where I was born, and uh, dad would take the train, believe it or not, from Freeville to Cortland. Now you imagine that today? <laughs> and the train would stop in front of their house and pick him up. He'd wave him down, he'd jump on the train, and go to, imagine taking the train to commute to go to the fire department. So dad worked like seven days a week, and he started selling fire extinguishers, and that led to the fire equipment company, which started in the early 50s. 
So by the time I was about 10 or 12 years, uh, he built the first fire truck for the company in Preble Fire Station. And they needed a fire truck, so they built it right in the firehouse. A bunch of welders and guys, and they, that's how it started the company, right in the dad was fire chief. And the next thing you know, he was building fire trucks, and we built our first tanker for Preble, and we built one for Homer, then we built one for McGraw, and then one for Truxton, and that started Salisbury Fire Equipment. Uh, I was graduated in 61, and uh, I went to fires all through the 60s with Dad and Art Rader from Homer and Shorty Connolly from here, and Bob, or Bill Parsons, who was county for coordinator. So all the fire chiefs, all intermingled, you know, were all good friends, the writers and Homer and everybody. Uh, so I grew up kind of building fire trucks. I think we moved to Kurtz Welding about somewhere around, I think, 58 or 59. And Dad started the business up in Chittenango at a welding shop, then came to Kurtz Welding. Then when 81 went through, went right over the, the place in Marathon, and that's when uh, Earl Kurtz built uh, the place on, on Galatia Road. And that's where our fire truck plant really got going. They were up to about 30 or 40 trucks that in 1968, uh, to 71 area right in there we moved to Tully over on the back road by the Tully uh, rail station and by Hind Agway and we built that plant with uh, believe it or not my mom and dad mortgaged their house and got a hundred thousand dollar loan and we built that factory and we had 12 employees and that's how we really got started about 1970 and I left by then I left my job as a fire protection engineer went to work for the company so then it started growing. My brother-in-law came to work, my brother did, and we started growing, and then pretty soon we're 21, then we're 31, then we're 41. By 1978, when Dad died, we were about 35, 40 people, and we were de delivering about two fire trucks a month. Then in 88, uh, Bud Quinlan from Cortland Fire Department came up one day into my office and said, when are you going to move your rear ends to Cortland County? And I laughed at him, because we were in Onondaga County. And he says, well, he says, I got some money from industrial development, and he says, if you would be interested, I think I can get you some money. Well, that conversation that afternoon, within three months, led to a $5 million loan from Cortland County Development, and we built the plant in Preble, and we moved from Tully to Preble, and then turned the Tully plant into a service center. And at that point, we had 35 people in Tully, and we ended up, when we sold the company in 1998, we had almost 300 people. We were producing almost 250 fire trucks a year, and we were a $50 million company, and we were in the top six in the United States. And I, I, I don't know how it happened. Uh, I know one thing, my brother was CFO, and he made it happen because he was the money guy that kept us in business. But uh, it was so funny, uh, when you start a business, you need money to grow or you gotta have profits, and that pays for the growth. The company that bought us was called Emergency One Federal Signal. They ran it for about three years and ran it in the ground and finally moved the factory to Florida. And uh, there's still Salisbury fire trucks out there today. We build about 5,000, they're all over the world. And uh, Everybody asked me, uh, would you ever do it again? I love the company, and would you sell it? Hell no, we would never have sold it if we'd known they were gonna close it. But that's what happens when you're in business. It doesn't matter if you're Coveco or Durkees or Brewer Titchener's or any of these companies here that have gone, it normally goes through that tradition of the family selling to a big company and they close it. And just like Cooper and everybody else that's happened. So, uh, in a way, our whole world is full of big corporations today, the Coca-Colas and General Motors. But looking back, it was a great life. It was about 65, 70 years of our business. We had a great time. We had a lot of families. We built a lot of homes, bought a lot of pickup trucks, and, and supported a lot of families, and we were real proud of that. Um, uh, I can name you families that are still close friends of ours that work for us from DeRider and other, other towns. Um, so when that happened, I had to go to work. I was 55 years old, 
And what do you do the rest of your life when you go from president to nothing? And I love fire trucks and I love fire systems, so I had to work for Emergency One for five years. When that got over, I decided I'll keep doing consulting. So I started consulting and I got a couple inquiries and all of a sudden it's been going super for 20 years consulting. I'm 75 and uh, we sold the company when I was 55. So uh, now I'm getting to the point where I'm saying, what the heck am I into? And I can't get out of it and I'm, I guess I can get out of it, but I love what I do. I'm having a ball. All right, I'll do this fast now. If you've got any questions, just stop me and ask me. Uh, this is the fire truck that was crushed in 9-11. If I'm in the way here, bear with me. I'll try to stay out of your way so I'll move. Uh, <clears throat> there were five of these. We lost, I think, three in 9-11. And believe it or not, one truck was crushed, and they still used the truck because they could walk in and out of it to get the stuff out of it. But uh, we lost 21 trucks in 9-11. That sounds very good. What that heavy rescue is? That heavy rescue is, we call it, a, about a 24-footer. There's six or seven of them in New York City. We did the hazmats. We sold over 100 trucks in New York. And heavy rescue, you have heavy rescue in the police and heavy rescue in fire. They kind of compete against each other. My business life has carried me from all over the world. This is Anchorage Fire Department delivered uh, 25 trucks up in Alaska, and the reason I did because I love to fish, so I'd sell a fire truck and go fishing. <laughs> so my brother always excused me, we never made any money on those fire trucks. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's Bob Coates, Bob's 88. He's got black hair, believe it or not. He's a great friend of mine, been a good friend for almost 50 years. This was uh, two weeks, three weeks ago in Perth. Uh, this is a fire truck show that I went to. Brunei. Brunei is on the north shore. Of the no Brunei is on the north shore of Indonesia. Indonesia, you know, is a huge, long country, about 3,000 miles wide, like the United States, and they have like 10,000 islands. But there, I was testing a foam system and an SO or no Shell oil refinery. So I go to Chile. Anybody been to Chile? You can't go there. That is my next favorite country after South Africa. Or South Africa, Chile, and Australia. Three of the best. I go to Chile, and the guy says to me, he said, I gotta meet you because I gotta show you something. So I go to this fire station, and here's a Salisbury fire truck. Uh -huh. And of all the trucks, I open up the door, and it says Patchogue, Long Island. That's where I sold the truck. I sold the truck and it's still in service in Chile. Wow. Today, this is their first run truck. So a lot of Salisbury trucks have gone to South America. Um, that was pretty cool. That was a replacement truck of a truck we built in 1968. It was called a ground ladder truck and a rescue. So the guys went in the middle of it, and the back it had ground ladders on each side, which is a very unusual truck in our country. China, uh, this is Beijing where the Olympics were, the Great Wall. Um, I've been going, last year I made seven trips to China working. So I, I just came home there two weeks. Uh, so I've only been there once this year. But I've been, uh, this is a fire show called China Fire that was in September. But the uh, second biggest show in the world of fire trucks. So it's like you guys going shopping, it's for me, this is my Disney World. This is a fire truck factory where I work in China. It's huge. This, this company makes about 500 trucks a year. And everywhere I go, I have buddies. And those are from uh, Frank and his sister and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ni. He's 88 years old. He doesn't speak a word of English and him and I are great friends. We talk through an interpreter and he respects me and I respect him. Unbelievable man. It's about an eight, six hour uh, train ride to Beijing from his factory. And he was going alone, 88, working like hell. Some of the crazy fire trucks in China, that's an exhaust fan, believe it or not. So that would go into a tunnel like a, uh, you know, subway to blow the smoke out, to get people out. This is a big, huge foam tanker. Uh, China builds 7,000 fire trucks a year, and the United States builds 5,000. 
This, believe it or not, I got a movie of this thing, but it's a jet engine out of a freighter jet. And they inject foam and water into this as pivots away, and they walk, come up to a building like a Kmart, and they can put foam and water into that thing and blow it right straight through and almost blow the fire out. Totally different way. We don't even have anything like that in the United States. Pump panels, believe it or not, that black thing in the middle is called a pressure governor. It's made in Long Island. So there's a lot of inner relationships between the China Fire Service and the American Fire Service. This is a fire pump that they make in China. It's a pretty good one. I went to an industrial trade show in northern China called Harbin. They have really good beer there. They have a brewery they're famous for. But this is a whole university school for fighting industrial fires, a company called Sinopac. Sinopac basically is the biggest oil company in China. They employ 500,000 people. Wow. Uh, but this is all stage fire. And the cool thing about this, these are all robots. Everything was fought without a person. The whole fire was put out with robots. Just absolutely amazing. And up in the corner, the whole thing was filmed with those robots and that uh, drone. They had five or six drones running and filming the whole thing. This is Colombia, South America. I gave a speech down there about a year ago. Uh, uh, this is my buddy, Jorge Prado, and uh, this is the fire chiefs from uh, the country of Colombia. And this year I went to Finland. When was this? Last week in uh, June. And Finland was uh, not as great as I thought it was going to be. It's flatter than heck. It's like going to Quebec. Uh, there's not much there where I was. I was in, uh, uh, went up about three hours from Helsinki. But this company makes these telescopic uh, aerial ladders, the biggest in the world. They go up 300 feet in the air. They're the biggest manufacturers of aerials called Bronto Skylift. They're owned by a company in Japan now, and I'll be going to meet their partner company in Japan on uh, Monday. This is Finland, but Finland looks like it's Germany or Holland, as far as the, the type. Biggest, this is India. I wish I could show you all these, I'm gonna run out of time. India is, is the worst country I go to. Don't go there. It's dirty, it's crummy, it's, it's everything. It's really, really different. And it's tough for me to handle because I wanna make things better and it's tough to do anything in, in, in that country. But I'm teaching them how to build fire trucks. Here we're twisting a truck and you see it at an angle. And there's some of my sketches that I do and how we spring mount bodies. So I design these things and show them how to build them. Now, this is their new fire truck factory. And uh, I helped design it. And inside it, you see all the cloth on the floor? Well, when you eat you know, inside, you take your shoes off in any house in India, because uh, the place is so dirty outside. But uh, they put these cloths down while they were eating. Now I'm in Indonesia, Malaysia. That's a fire training center and a nice, pretty nice fire truck. And that is in Malaysia. I was there about a month ago. This is Indonesia, a company called uh, AYAXX. That is Nadim. And cool guys, 32 years old, he runs the whole factory. They build 163. That guy's name's Bang Bang, of any name. I'm just to have a name, Bang Bang. Uh, Mexico. Uh, this is my first job I ever had as a consultant. It's in uh, Salamanca, uh, in Guadalajara province. This uh, fella is just like my dad. He was a fire chief and decided to build fire trucks, and now he's got a fire truck company. Same story as Salisbury. I worked for him about eight years, still do. And uh, those are all his grandchildren. He's got four boys and one daughter. And uh, they've kind of grown up with me. That's called a tilt table and a twist test. This is a crash truck they built in Mexico, believe it or not. And that table I helped design, and that's a twist test to meet NPA standards for a fire truck. Now, imagine this as one of your grandsons to have a bedroom like that. That's a simulated fire station with drawings of fire trucks of everything and he made this whole th his first grandsons into a fire station bedroom and they made it all in their fire in the factory 
Saudi Arabia, this is where I work. I was on the phone at 4 o'clock this afternoon talking to the vice president of this company. These are some of the extrusions I designed to build these fire truck bodies called Retta. France, I was there in June, and that's a TGV, which is the high speed train in France. Food, outstanding. We were there during the uh, uh, FIFA games, the soccer games. And oh uh, boy, did I have fun. Every night there was huge parties and celebrations, you know, when France won. Uh, this is Thailand. This is in the river going through the middle of Bangkok. Uh, it's pretty cool. I love Thai food. This is my best friend. His name is Julepong. And if you've never had uh, mango and sticky rice, have it. If you go to a Thai restaurant, that's the best thing in the world for dessert. These are some of my buddies, Supong. That's the president. They call him the professor in the blue shirt, but this is the fire truck production in, Taiwan, in Thailand. This is Turkey if, uh, in the uh, isthmus there where the ships go between the Caspian and Black Sea, you know, and the ocean. And uh, this is a company that make power takeoffs for fire trucks, and they ship them all over the world. Komaksin. Here I am in Dubai. <coughs> this is the tallest building in the world, right here. This is the conference I'm working for this company here. This guy, is, his name is uh, my buddy Sabbath. I was talking to him and now about two hours ago, and that's my friend Mohammed Ezzet. And uh, they're good Muslims. They go to church. They pray more than we do, I'll tell you that. Crazy thing about the world fire protection. You've got fire hydrants in McGraw and Homer and Tully and Cortland. Abu Dhabi and these cities don't have fire hydrants. Don't have them. So when they have a fire, they got to bring the water and tanker. Same thing's true in Mexico City. Same thing's true in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And so if you see sprinkler systems in buildings, they have an underground tank and fire pumps for their own protection. This is a fire truck I built this past month. I just tested this in July. That's a Bronto truck from uh, Finland. But this truck I engineered, tested it, and I was pumping that day right there on that truck. We are pumping uh, 3,000 gallons a minute, and the truck cost $1.3 million. And that day, it was 122 degrees when I was pumping. And I could only stay out in the sun about every, uh, uh, I was there for about two hours, and I have to get cooled off and go back out again. This is where I'm heading next week. I'm going to Taipei. I'll visit this company. This is in downtown Taipei. They build fire trucks about 30 a year. The interesting thing on this picture, those are fish. If you're very wealthy in China, Korea, Japan, you have fish as your hobby. These tanks are 20 foot square, 15 feet deep with cooling, refrigeration, and feeding systems. And if you're very, very wealthy, you have a lot of fish in the factory, right in the factory. Not, as, not at your home, but right in the plant. Coming to the end, I'm wrapping up quick. I have a lot of friends all over the world, and one is in where the hurricane hit yesterday. I called him and I prayed for my buddies. But uh, this is right where the hurricane came in in Alabama, just right by Gulf Shores. This is Sun Belt, great people, good friends, and uh, just super people. When you see all the wildland fires in California, all those firemen and all the fire airplanes and helicopters come out of Boise. That's the center of our interagency firefighting in the western United States. And that's where all, it's like a college campus, and this is what it's called. They build fire trucks there, and my buddy Matt Stocker, a good, good friend of mine. You ever see these little ladders you see on TV, little giant ladder company? You know those A-frame things you get up in the attic with? This is the company, I work for them. That's the mountains behind. I went skiing that afternoon up in Brighton. But uh, I went down in Cortland to a meeting one day, and there's one right on the Cortland fire truck. So uh, they're the biggest manufacturer of these A-frame ladders. A really cool thing, and they're all Mormons. Everybody that works at the company, I'm home. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>